Hey everyone, my name is Dan Shemolinsky. People like to call me Shimmy, and you can too. And welcome back to our sample school, our deep dive into sound paint. In our last session, we talked about racks and the various modules that you have accessible there, some controlling per part, some controlling the entire program. Well, today we are dealing with the effects section. Now we had some effects in the rack sections, but they were kind of simple, quick, just gotta get a reverb, gotta get a delay. Well, if you wanna go deeper and you want more options and more control over your effects, those modules will live here. And today we're going to go through all of them and show you how all this stuff sounds, how we can use it, and the various emulations we have for reverbs, filters. It's going to be a good time, so let's get started. I'm going to load just a simple oscillator from the Polywax library. This is a square wave. I like square waves to demonstrate effects. <laughs> So it's kind of a neutral sound and you can really hear what the effects are doing to this part. Let's start from the top with delay. Now, we had a delay module in our rack section, but it was very simple. It was just delay time feedback, but you'll notice we have much more complex profiles in our delay sub menu here. A quick refresher on what a delay is. Delay takes a sampled note and plays it again after a amount of time that you decide. So currently I have a one second delay on this bucket brigade delay here and it will play it one second later. Now what characterizes a bucket brigade delay is as the repeats happen, they get duller and quieter. So you can hear that instantly it gets a little bit duller and softer on the repeat. Now how quickly that repeat happens is controlled by delay time. So we just shortened it to basically half a second there. And how many repeats you have is controlled by the feedback percentage. and now you can really hear that it's getting quieter and duller as it goes down. You have a master wet dry control on all of these delays, by the way. That means what percentage of the sound is the original sound without the delay and what percentage of the sound is just delay. So you'll notice if we go to 100% wet, that's gonna be all delay. You don't even hear the first note, you just hear the delay and vice versa if it were set at zero, there would be no delay. We can make it really, really fast and really, really feedback if we want. We have a few settings on our left hand side here. We have a long and short toggle. This is just a great way to kind of switch between the two. This is a relatively longer delay. But if we want it to be short, we can get almost like a slap back kind of sound. And the delay time slider corresponds to this toggle. So where this slider is set is now 0.095 seconds. But if we click long, it's now 0.375 seconds. In our Bucket Brigade delay section here, we have a ping pong option, which means it takes your stereo delay, which is both firing in each speaker at the same time, and it ping pongs them. So you'll get a left, right repeat instead. Which is especially fun with a lot of feedback and the short selected. Ooh, feels really nice. We're gonna get into LFOs in a later episode, but in short, LFO in delay gives you sort of a warping vibrato effect. You can control how much it warps by using the depth. That's not warping much at all. And you can control the speed of that warping with rate. This is fantastic if you're trying to create some kind of lo-fi effect, some kind of tape warbly delay sound. And we can head over here to adjust the tone of our delay. And you can also control the gain boost of just the delay effect. So you can make the delay significantly louder or softer. This analog slider here increases the percentage of chance of random occurrence. 
you might notice you're getting a little more flutter. Really, really nice and definitely perfect for some genres. And you do have a DAW sync option, which changes your delay timer from seconds to actual note values so that you can have the delay synced with whatever project you're working on. Digital delay is a little bit cleaner. It's a little bit more modern sounding. But the cool thing about this one is you can actually control different amounts of time for your left and right channel. Right now it's set to a very fast 0.25 seconds and 0.5 seconds. So that means that left channel is bringing back the delay after 0.25 seconds and the right channel is bringing it after 0.5 seconds. And your stereo slider basically controls the width. How left right are we going here? So this is very, very left right, 100% stereo. If we turn that to zero, it's basically a monophonic delay. Rain delay and scatter delay. Rain delay kind of mimics what it would be like when raindrops are falling on say a rooftop and it's a little bit of a random pattern and just kind of deviates ever so slightly from the pulse. We have a deviation percentage, delay time and feedback. Modulation, this is gonna be that LFO vibrato-y kind of warbly control. Dampening is a tone controller. Pan spread is the same as the stereo slider. I would love to just show you a couple different presets and you can see where the sliders are to get the idea of what this thing sounds like. So that's a little demo of the rain delay. Scatter is similar, except it's more focused on like a bouncing type sound rather than random raindrops. It's, it's more of a percussive bounce. So you're getting almost a consistent pulse. This is kind of a swung rhythm. You can reverse the delays. You can get that per round kind of fading that we got on the bucket brigade delay where it gets a little quieter as it goes on. And I'm just going to play through some presets for you. So I would say very much in the same vein as the rain delay, but you're getting a little less randomness, a little more percussiveness and control over how many delay bounces you're getting. We've got two distortions. Distortions makes things fuzzy, grizzly, bitey. We've got a digital one where we can use the boost control and the distortion control to make it nice and fuzzy. Boost is really just volume, but it does make the distortion more present. This is the digital distortion, and I would say this is actually a more subtle distortion. You're just getting a nice little analog warmth kind of vibe. You can change the profile here to just a straight up fuzz pedal if you want. A little bit different from distortion. And you can do kind of a compression type distortion. Very subtle. Almost emulating the little analog distortion you get from older compressors. Then we have the analog distortion, boy. These are fun. You get some weapons of choice. We have gone into the icon phase of sound paint. This is obviously perfect for guitars if you want to dirty up your guitar sounds. Let's take this Thunderstick guitar and try that with some analog distortion. There it is. So 12 very different profiles for this analog distortion. And then these controls are really just mainly controlling your amount of fuzz. You can trim it to kind of tame it a little bit. Crossover point does that as well. You can control the overall gain of the distortion. And of course your wet dry mix. It's pretty gnarly. Before we get too deep, one thing I should mention about the effects section, the order of your effects matters. It goes from left to right, literally. So let's say I have a delay and then a distortion. The tone will play into the delay. The delay will affect that tone. And then the result of that tone and the delay will be distorted. If I switch the order of these effects, 
the tone goes into the distortion, the distorted affected tone then goes into the delay, and that is what's repeated. Play around with the order of your modules because the signal flow does matter. Then we have two simple EQs that are super, super easy to use and fun. We have a five band parametric. You can move these guys around as you wish to cut or emphasize different areas of the frequency range. You can also set presets here. And one thing to note is you can set a Q value for each of these points. And Q basically is the width of the band. The higher the number, the finer the band. But yeah, it does what an EQ does. You can change the type of each EQ band. So we have a low pass allowing the low tones to pass through, cutting high. High pass, letting high tones pass through, cutting the low. Band pass, band reject, low shelf, high shelf, or parametric, which is standard. So you can really use it to shape the sounds of your program. And then we have a 10 band EQ. This one is not as movable left, right. You just get straight up and down control for all of these frequencies. You can kind of hold your mouse down and draw a curve if you wish. And the Q value is the same for all of the bands. Filters, we know what filters are. We've talked about them before, but a quick refresher. Filters cut or shape the tone in a variety of ways. We have three main profiles here. We have a modern analog filter profile. Right now I have my filter wide open. It's not doing anything to the tone of this square wave. But I have the type set to low pass, which means I'm letting low information pass through. So it will cut high end information, darkening my tone. Poles kind of lets you select the intensity of your drop off. It's kind of the intensity of the curve of that filter. So if I set a low cutoff point, you will hear that that sounds very different when it's a four pole filter versus a two pole filter. Mess around with it, see what works best for you. It really becomes apparent when you start to work in some resonance, which we talked about before. adding that accented frequency point, that resonant chamber aspect. We use these filters to shape our sound. And in that effort, we've given you an envelope within the filter. Notice we have the same types of controls, attack, decay, sustain, release. And by toggling cutoff on your left side, you can control the motion of this slider using an envelope. So right now we have no attack, no decay, no release, and 100% sustain. So nothing is gonna be moving. When I put my finger down, that's where it goes. But if I lower my sustain point and I add a little bit of attack and a little bit of decay, it opens up that cutoff slider. And that is not volume. That is actually the filter. We can increase the resonance and maybe try a four pole filter to really, really hear it filter is opening and closing. We're getting a wow sound. You can make it really, really snappy if you want, really, really funky. So, envelopes can control the motion of other things than volume as well. In this case, the filter cutoff. You can invert your envelope. This gets a little bit complicated, but basically it's taking that ADSR module and flipping it upside down. Here's an example of what that sounds like. So instead of getting an owl sound, you get more of a wow sound. So the end sustain point is actually open, not closed. You can change the type of filter that you're using here. We have a low pass filter, a high pass filter, band pass, band reject, low shelf, high shelf, parametric, or all pass. In short, they remove frequencies from your sound. That is the point. And as you are deciding which profile to use, I would implore you to set one up and just click through and see the difference in sound. Bring in some resonance and do a little sweep. So that's clearly cutting high end information. High pass is gonna do the opposite. Band pass, something a little bit different. Almost a high pass and a low pass together, right? Band reject. 
Low shelf kind of takes all your low tones and affects them uniformly. High shelf does the same for your upper frequencies. Parametric is more akin to an EQ band and an all pass filter sounds like this. Sort of similar to the band reject. They're all very different. Sound paint is about exploring. So hop in and see what these do. You get some cool character effects here. You get life. Life is very similar to analog. I think it's a little more subtle than analog. And distortion, which is good to use if you feel like you're losing low end information or you just need a little bit more grit, a little more pop to your filter. And that's just one of three profiles you get. The next one's gonna be a ladder filter, which is kind of similar to the Moog style filters. Very smooth, very buttery. slightly different type of tone. The big characteristic here is when resonance is raised, you tend to lose bass frequencies a bit. Right? But you can compensate for that with distortion. like before you do get ADSR controls here as well. And the final filter profile is true state variable. This filter profile is similar to maybe the Oberheim kind of style filters. You get your similar modes here, high pass, band pass, band reject, low pass, and your life and distortion as well. And of course, ADSR control. Next, we're gonna take a look at reverbs. And one thing you're gonna start to notice is we have a lot of things that are emulating hardware from music productions past. Reverb, if you don't know, is the artificial creation of a space, such as a concert hall or a jazz club. Oftentimes the samples just exist in isolation, completely dry and kind of sterile. A great way to give some room to your programs is to add reverb. It's got a reflective space. You can almost picture what it would look like if I was playing that through a speaker into a room, right? And like the filters and the delays, they all have their own unique profiles. So just a quick run through of the parameters that you get on most of these delays. You'll get a time control. That's how long the trail of the reverb is. This one goes up to 27 seconds. You've got your wet dry control as well. So 100% dry is none. So you can really, really fine tune how much reverb you want. How much of that signal is being sent into the reverb chamber that you're creating. Dampening kind of works like a low pass filter on the reverb only. So if you're finding that too many upper harmonic frequencies are bouncing off of your artificial space, you can cut that down by bringing your dampening lower. So completely wide open pretty bright, you can bring that down lower and you get a very, very darker reflection. And finally, size. What is the hypothetical size of this, you know, space? We're not in square footage here, but we, we do have a range from four to 16 and it does make a big difference. Size and time kind of work together. Time really deals with the amount of trail. Size is more of a characteristic aspect of the space. You get an analog control to kind of give yourself some randomness, some aged effects, and just an overall tone control. So if it's too dark for you, you could raise the tone up a bit. I've done this many times. That's a big difference and cuts out a little bit of that super, super subby range. Grain reverb is kind of the raindrop delay, scatter delay equivalent of reverbs. You have these controls like grain size, number of grains. I'm just gonna go ahead and play into this and you can see what kind of vibe this will give you. So grain size is roughly gonna be like the amount of time each grain is. And you can add some detunes. This is kind of similar to the vibrato, what the LFO is doing in the other delay. But a little more intense. <laughs> This is the Lexi, and it is a classic emulation of Lexicon reverbs. Very, very popular, arguably the most popular reverb in the 80s, into the 90s, even today. They're known for having really smooth emulations of halls and rooms. We have some new controls to look at here, and probably the most important one is pre-delay. Fundamentally, with every reverb, the pre-delay starts at 0%, meaning as you play that note, the reverb is immediately apparent. But if you'd like to give sort of a delay effect up front, you can offset with pre-delay when that reverb starts. I'm just gonna go ahead and repeat a note and slowly increase the pre-delay and you'll hear what I mean.
you're basically taking the reverb and saying, don't start right away, start a little bit later. Then you have balanced sliders between early and late reflections. Early reflections are the ones that reach the listener's ear almost immediately in a space. And late reflections are kind of the more washier sounding reflections that reach the listener's ear after the stuff's bounced around a little bit. Just for demonstration's sake, let's do 100% early and 0% late. You get that initial reflection, but no kind of cloudy diffuseness in the back, right? But if I'm 100% late and 0% early, I just get the wash. Talked about time before, that's the time of the trail, size of the room. This one's actually measured in square meters, which I think is kind of cool. My understanding of shape and spread is this has to do with literally the physical shape of the hall of the room. You have selectors on your left side for profiles. You can do a room emulation, which is going to be a smaller, shorter reverb, or you can do hall, which is going to be a little cloudier, a little more diffuse. Here's an example of a hall preset. This one's called Recital Hall. And again, you do get presets for all of these reverbs. It's a really, really great way to explore. Versus let's try an example of a room preset. This one's called Jazz Club. So a little bit of a smaller reflection, almost like a chamber. And then we have a plate emulation. Now plate reverbs are very interesting because it involves a literal metal plate with a series of pickups and microphones typically. The sound gets fed into the actual physical metal plate and these things are huge. So you get a very metallic, resonant, quick responding reverb. But to me, this sounds very, very alive, very, very quick, and very, very resonant. And that's in part to these two controls here, input diffusion and tail diffusion. Diffusion just means it's diffusing or softening an element of the sound. And finally, the shimmer. Shimmer introduces an artificial space that's really meant to just be super diffuse and super reflective. This is great for pads. And it also introduces its own harmonics. It's like you can play this reverb. This reverb is an instrument. I have to pull up a synth pad for this one. Let's try this one from the JX8 library. I'm gonna turn the reverb off just to listen to it. Very nice, but let's put some shimmer reverb on this. I'm going to cut the pitch element that I just said, the whole playing the reverb thing. This is just gonna be the space that you're hearing. very hard to emulate that in the physical form, right? This slider here is called pitch mix, and it's basically how much of that artificial pitch, that artificial sparkle that I was talking about, how much of that do you want in your reverb? Stars. <laughs> That's magic to me. Moving right along, we have the bit brush. This is sort of distortion E, except the distortion is not created by introducing feedback and a lot of gain. It's actually introduced by down sampling, degrading the quality of the sound. I'm gonna go ahead and load up a uh, simple square wave here from the JX library. And I chose that for a reason because you will immediately recognize the sound of the bit brush from video games. So this is no bit brush. This is with Bitbrush. It's chopping up into bits. Now you can choose the resolution here. One is the lowest resolution. 16 is the highest resolution. I'm gonna go ahead and sweep through the bit depth so that you can hear what they all sound like. sample rate, it almost gives like a ring mod kind of sound, right? This thing sounds great on a piano. So 
So yeah, bit brush, bit crush as it's sometimes referred to. Lo-fi, downsampling, degrading the quality of your samples. Moving right along, we have chorus. The best way you're gonna be able to describe a chorus is kind of a phasey vintage effect. On synthesizers, it almost sounds like you're adding an extra oscillator that's slightly detuned from the other one. If I load up a saw wave from the J8X library, and I turn on chorus, check out what it does to the sound. It's like there's a multiple of my note and it's slightly not quite the same note. It's a little detuned, right? And we're hearing the phasing of that out of tuneness. It's just a great way to add some subtle or not so subtle motion to your program. I'm gonna let you decide what all these sliders do because I have my own way of interpreting them and, and describing them. But again, I'm gonna go ahead and increase stuff and you can hear what it sounds like. that's amount of intensity, amount of detuning. Check out feedback. <laughs> feedback is literally that, how much we're spooling that up and feeding it back into itself. So basically getting multiples on multiples so it can really get out of control. Low cut is just a simple way to remove some of the low frequencies from the chorus effect. If it's getting too muddy, you're gonna wanna go to your low cut. Let's check out modulation. <laughs> Very similar to the LFO that we have on the delays and reverbs. And stereo, stereo image. And then finally we have a voice count. And to me, this sounds like the amount of duplicates we have, the amount of singers in the chorus. Let's go to one and just hear what that sounds like. It sounds to me like there's just one other duplicate and I'm gonna slowly raise it up. We can get up to 16 voices, giving max stackage, max clashing of frequencies. Very cool. So yeah, if you want to get things kind of slightly sounding out of tune, but in a nice, pleasing way, chorus is the way. I'm gonna do a quick run through of what compression is before I talk about the settings here. Compression deals with dynamics. It is a dynamic control unit. Instruments play very dynamically. Sometimes we're soft, sometimes we're loud. And sometimes to make sure that instrument is really heard and crystal clear, you have to shrink the range of how loud it goes and how soft it goes. Compression does just that. When you're in the car and listening to something incredibly dynamic like classical music, right, where there's a lot of loud to soft stuff back to back, you might be working the volume knob to turn it up when it gets quiet and then quickly back down when it gets loud again. Compression sort of does that for you. So for example, let me pull up our 1928 sustain here. And if I add a lot of this compressor, which is an emulation of a very famous compressor called the LA-2A, it will make my softs louder and my louds softer. Check this out. Here's no compressor. Here's with compression. It's loud, right? It's loud, but it's not as loud as it should be for the gain adjustment that I just made. So it kind of squashes your dynamic range a bit. We know attack and release from our envelopes, right? So this is gonna be how quickly the compression acts and releases. The threshold is the level at which it starts to take place. So right now it's set to negative 7.16 decibels. Any sound above that will be raised up. So if you want a very gentle amount of compression, you can have this pretty low. Or if you want extreme amounts of compression, you can have it set at the top. playing very softly, but it's very loud in the mix. This is very, very characteristic of pop piano kind of sounds. But 
I can quickly play softly, and the volume change is not that drastic. Right? We have gate. Gates open and close. A gate in sound paint and musical production does the same exact thing. It allows the sound to come through or not come through. And it comes through at a pace or a tempo that you set. Now this little fun drawing block here is pretty illustrative, but I'm gonna talk you through it. You can make various patterns using this block right here. If you think of these as steps, the gate goes from left to right, row one, row two, row three, row four. So right now I have nothing selected. No squares are highlighted. If I push down a note, nothing will go through. Let's start adding some squares. So basically, everywhere there is a square filled in, I am letting the tone through the gate. You can set your tempo here, so if I want this whole thing to go through the sequence faster, I can do that, but I can also change the note value or the division of that tempo. The mix slider, which is currently set to 100%, so I'm opening and closing it, it's either going through or not, can lessen that effect if you want. So it can just give a slight volume increase as opposed to completely binary off or on. And attack and release work like any other attack and release. If I have those set to zero, it's going to be very harsh edges on these squares. But if I back off on the attack, it'll fluff up the front of it. Each one of those squares is firing this simple attack release envelope that we have here. And likewise, if I bring some release, the trail, the closing of the gate will be softened. It can add a subtle rhythmic pulse. It can be a true stabbing kind of rhythmic pattern. It's really up to you. Next, we have a phaser. I think phasers are kind of like far out, man, right? Like very trippy, very, you know, meditative 70s vibes. My understanding of how phasers work is that the signal is actually split into two. One of the signals is processed and then reintroduced into the signal so that you get a phasing sound. That phasing sound is so characteristic It almost sounds like a filter opening and closing, right? You can choose how fast you want that to happen by using the rate knob. And how deep or how much of a phase you can have by using the depth knob. Feedback introduces feedback, which is gonna be that same kind of reflective vibe that we've seen in reverbs and delays. It almost introduces resonance in this case, that's kind of cool. And if you want the rate to sync with your DAW, you can click DAW sync and change this to a note value. Here are a couple fun presets. So one very fast and one very slow. Great for synths, fantastic for guitars, that's kind of where they're at most at home. I mean, that's that sound. And last but not least, stereo imagers. I'd like you to take a look at this stereogram and picture yourself sitting right here where all of these lines meet up. This is your stereo image, the width of your stereo. How far apart are your speakers and how is the angle of each channel hitting your ear? This is no effect whatsoever. This is just your natural stereo image, but we can widen or shrink that stereo image. I'm gonna hold a chord and play with the width.
So essentially it's using an artificial imager to space out your stereo image, the distance and the angle at which your speakers are hitting your ear. If you wanna make it really, really focused and right down the middle, you can have it be 100% narrow. If you want it to be so wide that it's beyond the scope of your speakers, you can go 100% with it. You can also change where the center of this stereo image is. Right now, it's literally dead center, right? But if I rotate, but adding that stereo width makes it a little more complex than panning. So this is a great way to kind of perfectly place your stereo image for your program. That is the effects section. We have a lot of them. Most of this stuff comes from analog hardware, stuff that's kind of been a staple of most music production studios over the years. And to have the ability to quickly dial in, compare, and mess with these settings in sound paint is just invaluable. Anyway, that's all I have time for you today. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I will see you next time.